Okay, good morning everyone. Um, I'm now going to invite Aya to give us a Dhamma talk. And I'll just give you a little bit of background this first time. Um, so when the Buddha became awakened, uh, he was thinking that what he had learned was so simple and yet so profound that he didn't think he'd be able to teach anybody. So this um, this god from the Brahma realm came down and, and asked him to teach. And so the words that he said, I'm going to be chanting in, in Pali, but in English, the words are, the Brahma god Sahampati, lord of the world, with palms joined in reverence, requested a favor. Beings here are but with little dust in their eyes. Pray, teach the Dhamma out of compassion for them. Brahma Chaloka Dipati Sahampati Katanjali Anadiwarang Ayachata Santida Sata Parajatika Jat Parajakajatika Dese tu Damang Anukampi Mam Pajang That's just the power. I didn't disc. Oh no, it is the recording. No, not that. It's really wonderful to be here and uh, I'm very very grateful for all the causes and conditions that have led to this monastery and uh, all the work and all the goodness and the generosity that has enabled me to be here today so I think I'll say a few words I'll use the uh, chanting that we heard first thing this session as a kind of springboard because uh, these reflections, five reflections are like uh, daily uh, reflections for us and also for the monastics for sure. <laughs> uh, we're all of the nature to be born, to age, to die and we're all the owners of our, uh, of our karma we're all uh, here because of past actions, intentional actions, actions of body, speech or mind. And, uh, and yet, uh, hmm, is that really the case? <laughs> so I, just to take up the last uh, reflection, uh, because I also have in my mind a theme of equanimity. Uh, we are, yes, owners of our karma, uh, born of our karma, related to our karma. We abide supported by our karma. In the Pali, I find the language actually is helpful to go back to the Pali because I find it uh, the, the tone is a bit stronger than that even. 
uh, kama, like kama yoni, we're, we're yoked to our kama. Uh, kama bandhu, we're bound to our kama. It's like being uh, tied up, <laughs> chained to our kama. Uh, kama patisarana. Kama patisarana. Uh, sarana, you'll recognize, is the word for refuge. And the pati gives a sense for me of it's like we're over the overarching refuge we have is our kama. This is our refuge. This is what we have. This is all we have. And uh, <laughs> I find that quite depressing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's quite it's quite uh, uh, painful actually to consider, really consider this. Um, but of course the Buddha wasn't speaking to us in such a way as to depress and kind of <laughs> upset and, you know, lead us to despair. The important point is that these reflections are have many levels. Uh, and the obvious, the, the, the uh, important realization is Okay. <laughs> Hello again. <laughs> so we've had a wonderful moment. I always think the silence is much more important than the words, don't you? But anyway, this, this reflection is an encouragement for us to recognise, you know, the first noble truth. Dukkha, the suffering. Um, it's all rather unsatisfactory. We're born, that's painful and difficult, traumatic. Uh, <clears throat> people celebrate <laughs> all around the newborn child, uh, which is, of course, wonderful, a wonderful reflection on our meta, our goodness, uh, our love. But it's not, a, it's not an easy process, I'm sure, to be born. And, and then we age, and goodness me, you know. Uh, it's good to reflect on this when we're young, isn't it? Because just to be ready to, to resource ourselves, uh, to meet the challenges of aging, and then we die, and the same applies to that. And uh, get sick uh, any time, that can happen. And... Uh, so it's really good just to, to be uh, invited by the Buddha to go to those places of challenge, even when we're not challenged, you know, in good health, um, when life is going really well. And of course, we don't want to go there, but it's an, uh, there's an encouragement to uh, prepare, you know, prepare and resource and uh, be ready. So when these things come along, when the aging, the sickness and the death are approaching, we, we are actually quite equanimous. We have this equanimity uh, to hand. We have uh, methods, we have tools in our toolkit <laughs> we know how to work with. This dukkha, this inevitable dukkha, um, being a human being, and then uh, the last reflection is a real uh, invitation to consider a deeper level of reality 
Kama, uh, we are the owners, the heirs, that we're bound, we're caught up in, we're only here because of our Kama. And to really take that on board uh, is so helpful, so helpful in our lives, and not just personally, but also in relationship to everything that's going on around us. All the suffering, the enormous amount of suffering, distress, <clears throat> confusion, um, which can get to us. We read the news and we can really, you know, quite naturally uh, sometimes feel overwhelmed. But the Buddha was giving us all the resources to understand and to bear with dukkha, this suffering. So suffering outside of us, suffering within us also. You know, last night I didn't feel very well. It's like, why aren't I feeling very well, goes the mind. <laughs> well, I should be able to sleep now because it's time to say, uh, why, why? The mind will throw up, won't it? Um, negative thoughts when we're not well. It's quite natural. Actually, that's completely natural that we will, uh, when, when the body's ailing, so the mind is drawn into that and, and we can start to really have a lot of uh, negative thoughts, uh, aversion, you know. <clears throat> but uh, the problem, of course, and the deeper understanding within this teaching I am the owner of my karma, the heir to my karma, is the question mark, is to recognize that actually that's not ultimately true. It's not ultimately true that I am born, that I age, that I die, that I get sick, or that I'm the owner of my karma. We are compelled almost to believe these things and to really be immersed in these uh, realities. It's really how it looks. But uh, as the Buddha taught us, you know, to appreciate uh, causes and conditions is to appreciate that there is no person there is no me, there is no you who is born and dies and suffers through all the causes and results of karma. And it's the attachment to uh, the very powerful looking evidence that, that it is my karma and that I am going to die and that I was born. Um, we need to really... Uh, start to disentangle and come out of this, uh, ultimately, this delusion. Uh, this is freedom. And to see that it's our attachment to the body, our attachment to the mind, that creates the sense of self, that tethers us to our karma. And, you know, it's uh, always the questions come up, you know, why, do, why should this happen? How could this be? Uh, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to those people over there? Why are they having to suffer so much? And the Buddha told us, you know, many times in many suttas, you know, don't even try to understand uh, why these things are happening. That's not the point. Uh, we, it, the Buddha understood, the Buddha could fully see, but the rest of us, um, we're wasting our time if we try to tease out and understand why things happen. But what's important to me, what's really compelling and interesting and wonderful, is that we have the opportunity to look at what's happening now and to kind of, kind of take full responsibility for it, even as we recognise that this is not personal, that this is not to be owned, this karma that's led to this time is not to be chained to, 
It's not to make my refuge. This is not actually my refuge. It's not our refuge. It's not the refuge. Uh, recognizing causes and conditions is to see the impersonal nature of phenomena. It's just rolling on. Samsara is just rolling on endlessly, endlessly. And as Ajahn Bromley, I heard him say the other day, it's just one problem after another. <laughs> And we can laugh when we recognise that if the, it's ludicrous to uh, attach ourselves to that. One problem after another. Oh my goodness. So there's the liberating message in there. There's the encouragement to let go of that sense of ownership. Let go of the sense of ownership of our karma, but also, paradoxically or not, also take full responsibility for how it is right now and this is amazing amazing that we can do this because then we have the choice don't we to make it good or to make more suffering to let it end or to roll on you know with it to be chained and bound to it or to let it all go and as we learn to be less identified with, with the situation that we're in, in mind, in body, to be uh, aware of what's going on, to be mindful. And this mindfulness comes about through our good efforts to live a good life, to be generous, to be moral, to develop a meditation practice. We can start to see the, the attachment, we start to see where we're sort of glomming on to things and making them mine and we can start to just loosen that grip and allow things to flow and the good, the bad, the pleasant, the unpleasant uh, become something less of a roller coaster. Uh, we're not going up with the ups and down with the downs but we're more equanimous there's the equanimity that has a sort of evenness despite you know the inevitable worldly ups and down and so this reflection I, I just find so helpful it's a daily reflection on karma uh, we're the owners of our karma the heirs of our karma bound to our karma yes that's true and also it's actually uh, we can transcend this. We can let go of the attachment to self. And by doing that, we free up this process. And this is where equanimity uh, really manifests for us when we have the right view and we can see uh, this reality that we are actually not the owners of our karma. There is karma. <laughs> There is cause and effect. We have a job <laughs> to do, you know, to, to bear with, bear with, be with, uh, you know, to be with uh, whatever the conditions are and to turn them around in the sense of not reacting, not getting caught up, not identifying with, but making good. How can I skillfully manage this moment? How can I bear with this moment in a way that allows it to come to a place of peace? Lovely, peaceful moment. Okay. And I'd just like to point out, you probably know, most of you, <clears throat> that this reflection on Kama, it actually appears in the 
Also full Brahma Vihara's chant. Hmm. Same reflection. Same reflection. So also, you know, the quality of equanimity is one of the Bojangas, as you know, the factors of enlightenment. And it's the last one. It's the sort of culmination, uh, really, of the mind that's free. The mind that's free is the mind that is unshakable. And so there's, there's a lot to reflect on there. But I'm interested, I find it rather wonderful that uh, the reflection on karma is that which leads to equanimity and appears, uh, it appears as the fourth of the Brahma Viharas, the Brahma Viharas, the divine abidings. In love, metta, loving kindness, in equanimity, in compassion, karuna, and in mudita, joy. And uh, to, to appreciate uh, that these four are, in a way, they're all the same thing. They, they are all a reflection of the mind that's free, right? Because a mind that's free from greed and hatred, desire and aversion, and confusion, delusion, uh, the mind that ages, the mind that gets born and dies, the mind that is shackled to it, karma, to its karma. You know, this is a mind uh, that can't really uh, know these qualities in their full, to their full extent, but the mind that is uh, free that knows anatta, that knows, uh, understands that there is nothing personal about samsara. There's nothing personal about cause and effect. It has its own, it has its own flow, it has its own logic. It's not about me <clears throat> and mine. The mind that really understands and lets go of the sense of individuality is uh, full, full of love, full of compassion, looking around and seeing the suffering in the world. What is the, the only sane response? Compassion, compassion, trembling with, but not suffering, because really there's, there's nothing to suffer about. There is suffering, but we, we can choose, we have, the, we have the choice whether to dwell in that samsaric space of suffering or whether to let go of that, let go of suffering, let go of self and appreciate uh, the peace, the equanimity of Nibbana. So anyway, those are a few words on uh, this reflection this morning. Beautiful chanting from Ajahn Sona. Wow. Really beautiful. And uh, <clears throat> a few words on, uh, yeah, Upeka, Upeka, equanimity. So we've got about 20 minutes. And so I'd like to invite any comments, Reflections, questions. And I'm just going to sneak in a thank you. Handamayan Dhammakataya Sadhukaram Dadamase. Everybody, please join me. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So, just quickly, what I just said there in Pali <laughs> was now let it us express our approval of this Dhamma teaching and sadhu means it as well or I appreciate it. Okay, over to the questions. <laughs> Thank you, Sankaveta. <laughs> so just unmute yourself and speak out. I like 
So whoever's speaking right now, we're getting is just very broken up. Maybe can you put it in the chat? Can you type it in the chat? I just like to say welcome, Maya. I need to leave the Zoom. Okay, Kusla, if you're still there, your voice was coming through right at the end there. If you can try again, there you are. Okay, try again. Well, I, I was, yeah, I was just saying um, thank you, I, uh, and we need to leave early. I have a class, but um, I'll be in. I'll be in Canmore by Monday night, so be able to visit with you in person. And I look forward. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sorry, no. we, every time it goes off, we get muted, but yes, we can hear you. Everyone's frozen, except us. <laughs> well, detach from self and the belief that this is happening to me, um, or like, do I? Uh, uh, Kelly, do you want to just start at the beginning because you got frozen there? We missed the first part of your question. I'm not sure. If you can hear me, but. Um, yeah, I just, okay. Um, uh, um, do, uh, 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 Kelly, I don't know if you can hear us. You froze again. Do you want to try and, and type it in the chat? Try. <laughs> oh, now we can hear you briefly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll cut out again, but uh, yeah, we'll give this another go. If not, I'll sit with the question and maybe some insight. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Most people answer their own questions, don't they? Given a bit of time. <laughs> I put the question in the chat. Okay. Okay. Good. Is it there? Welcome, Aya. Not Thank yet. you for your wisdom and Thank you and welcome. Not there yet. Kelly, if you can hear us, maybe what you could do is, is give me an email or a call and we can set up a, a telephone interview with Aya if the internet's not working.
Okay, while we're oh, yeah, I'm I'm typing, but Leslie asked a great question. Oh, we totally missed that. <laughs> she she's typing, and she said Leslie. Oh, yes, so Leslie asked oh, a question, we but we it. sorry, mm -hmm. Leslie, we missed it. But you look mm -hmm. frozen right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good equanimity practice opportunity. <laughs> so good. <laughs> <laughs> what a gift maybe oh here we go do you want me to read it to you or can you read it uh, yeah I can read it um, okay I've spent a lot of time trying to understand the why of the personal suffering and would like to hear more about recognising the causes and connections and taking responsibility but not taking it as personal thank you I mean that <clears throat> seems to me that's the key question you know um, how not to take our suffering personally uh, how not to feel like we've done something wrong <clears throat> or we've done something right how not to own our experience um, and it's a really fundamental question. I think we, we find it maybe not so difficult to uh, recognize that we're, we're not this body. This body has its own agenda. It has its process from birth to death. And I don't know about you, but personally, I find that, you know, I don't really feel that I'm uh, <clears throat> tethered to this body. But I think where we can start to really, where the practice starts to really get interesting is where we can look at how we can feel uh, very identified with our minds, with our perceptions, with our memories, with our thoughts, with our uh, views and opinions and the sense of right and wrong and so on and so on. Our consciousness, uh, we feel that we own, we're here because we think, <laughs> something like that. Uh, it's very natural for us to feel this way. And so it, I would say when these questions come up for us, when we're really struggling to, to, to kind of understand the Buddha's teaching, you know, how can he say that... Um, this isn't my life, this isn't my family, this isn't my suffering. Uh, this anatta, this concept of not self, what does it mean? <laughs> uh, when we really uh, start to investigate, this is where uh, we can really make strides in our practice. And I would say to simplify, a simple answer would be um, when there's a sense of suffering, there will always be a sense of self and there will always be a sense of or an, an experience of wanting or not wanting, liking or not liking, uh, in short, desire or aversion and of course confusion because all of that is like a tangle, it's like a knot. And we uh, can recognize that uh, without a sense of <clears throat> me and mine, without a sense of wanting or not wanting, there can't be, really be any suffering. There's no suffering. Things happen for good or ill, but there doesn't, there's not the experience of dukkha, experience of suffering within. And so when you feel that uh, I'm suffering, then the call, the invitation, is to come home, come back to awareness of the body and mind, meditate, sit with it, <clears throat> breathe in and out, and just focus the attention on a simple object, whatever, the breath is a good object, uh, just to begin to allow the mind to disentangle itself from this knot of identification and of suffering. 
And we don't need to understand it. We don't need to know what's going on. We don't need to figure it out. That's a, a, an invitation for more suffering. That's more <clears throat> samsara. That's more problems. <laughs> we just need to meditate and, and to come back to the simple reality of this moment. And that can feel like the last thing we want to do when we're caught up in some kind of suffering, you know. It's, it's counterintuitive, you could say, which is why maybe, as Sangamitta was saying at the beginning, uh, the Buddha had to be begged, begged by the gods <laughs> before he was willing to teach, knowing what he knew, understanding what he understood, because it's actually quite difficult for us to let go of suffering. Really quite difficult, really very difficult. <laughs> so the last thing we want to do is to, is to stop and to sit back and to allow the mind some peace through a simple meditation practice. Um, but in this way, the process of letting go of the sense of me suffering, my suffering, uh, it can begin to soften, soften and slowly but surely uh, we can see our way through uh, to letting go of that sense of self-suffering. It's only self that suffers. So we can let go of suffering, we can let go of self uh, and be free. If we just notice, note that connection, note that cause and effect right there. So I really hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, please come back to me and we can discuss further your question. It's a, the really the most crucial question. So thank you for that. There's more rain that's come up. Okay, now then. Uh, thank you. Appreciation. Oh, lovely. Thank you about the person who's going away. Keep in touch. Tune in. I'm curious how to stay in a state of equanimity when powerful feelings arise that seem to completely take over the mind-body. Is it more of a practice of detaching from self and believing this is happening to me? Less expectations of people being kind and compassionate? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I mean, this is the very time, I think, when we <clears throat> struggle to see clearly uh, when we're overwhelmed by emotion. Isn't emotion, it's like a kind of wave. It's like, it's like being submerged in the ocean. It's like we can be completely taken off our feet, thrown in to the surf <laughs> and have our heads underwater uh, with emotion. Emotion will... Uh, it's, it's irrational um, often and we can get very caught up. Um, yes, and, you know, have expectations of people that are not met. Um, you know, when we don't get what we want, basically, we get upset. <laughs> we can just, you know, see it in that clear way. And when we get what we want, we generally just want more. So that's how we're programmed. You know, that, that this is the, uh, the net we're caught in. This is being bound to our karma. So it takes a lot of skill, um, but everyone can do this, to simply notice. Uh, pleasant feeling arises. I want more. More. More unpleasant feeling arises get it away from me I don't want it and I'll push it away and all the emotional repertoire uh, you could say is is based around this fundamental push and pull so with great compassion we can observe this through meditation uh, the answer to your question really is meditate because only really when we stop and look within, can we start to recognize the emotions, how they're moving within, 
Uh, how, did, how does it feel in the body? What's actually going on here? You know, and we can start to disentangle. And we can see our thoughts and expectations and wishes and desires around ourselves and other people and how that's playing out. So everything that you've discussed in your question, your excellent question, is really a, um, the, the answer is to, to, to look, to develop samasati, develop mindfulness, because then we can, we can begin to understand ourselves better. And when we get to understand ourselves better, what we're understanding is dukkha, first noble truth, and seeing the causes of dukkha, and seeing the end of dukkha, simply through the willingness to bear with the experience. Uh, everything is revealed in that way to us and we can step clear of this emotion, this emotional storm, that emotional storm. And emotions, by the way, of course, are completely natural. We don't have to make a problem out of them. We just observe them. It's quite interesting. It's like the weather, <laughs> isn't it? Like, I woke up this morning, oh my goodness, it's snowing outside. Uh, you know, <clears throat> yesterday something different. It's just like that. The weather just comes and goes. It's a climate, uh, constantly changing. And it's the same with our emotional life. So we can get to observe it uh, with great compassion and interest, actually. Uh, it's kind of amazing. But it's just that. It doesn't define us, and it's not ultimately who and what we are. And we can begin to... Step back from that identification through practice. So just keep meditating. Yeah. Okay. I think that's... Yes, that's all the questions from the chat. And Laura, uh, Corey. <laughs> Corey has a question here for I'm us. I'm actually going to think about it. That's lovely. So Corey, probably very wisely and compassionately noting the time, <laughs> is saying that her question, her question's going to sort of percolate, and she's going to consider, and we will have time to discuss, which is so wonderful. We'll have time to discuss later. So that's all the questions. Okay. Thank you. So 